Insightful Teaching with Jacob Prash on Moriel TV, where God is my teacher. As Amos was saying, well, perhaps I should just perhaps read from Thessalonians. Paul tells us that there's a satanic counterfeit of providence. And in 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, um, he tells us in verse 16 about being hindered, about being hindered. Men would come and try to hinder from what they were saying. And we've certainly had that, as he pointed out, we had people hack into us and begin using vulgarity, vulgar language, and all things of this nature. We we're also told in this epistle that it was not only man, but there were direct satanic attacks. There were direct satanic attacks. I wanted to come to you, but Satan hindered us. So people hindered and Satan hindered. Uh, this is in verse 18. We wanted to come to you. I pour more than once, and yet Satan hindered us. So first of all, there was the hindering in verse 16 from people, and then there was the hindering of the devil. When God is doing something, the enemy does not take it sitting down. We know that people are hungry for the word of God. With the COVID, a lot of churches are not meeting. With the general situation in the church, there's a lot of churches, probably more than we can count, are not expounding the word of God anymore. Some are, thank God for the ones that are, but many are not. So people are coming to ministries like ours. I'm not saying we're the only one, but we are one of them by God's grace, and they're coming to us, and we want to be faithful to them. But the attacks have been relentless. They have been ceaseless. One thing after another, things, forget about Murphy's Law, anything that can go wrong will go wrong. Things that you wouldn't think could possibly go wrong have gone wrong. So this will be our final, of this series, this will be our final teaching tonight. Many people are not going to be able to watch it on um, live stream. Many people were not given mail notifications. We're just going to bury the corpse and end it. It's been something that although people wanted it, although God may have blessed it, for he did bless it for some people, and for technical reasons, it has failed. We just couldn't get the mail list working. We couldn't get the live stream working. It's been pretty much a technical failure. Despite having very good people, it's just not worked out. Every week there's another problem. So what we're going to do is begin over. We're going to begin with a new series <clears throat> with a new technical configuration and a few other changes on Wednesday, the 3rd of March. The first Wednesday in March, we will resume and it'll be a little bit different than this, and hopefully we'll have all the kinks ironed out, but it will be done differently. People will be notified ahead of time by uh, email, and, and things will be more coordinated. Uh, that'll begin again on the first Wednesday of coming month of, March, of the coming month of March. So next week, not... No more Bible studies Wednesday for the rest of this month. In other words, we'll resume in two weeks. We'll resume in two weeks from tonight. And in the meantime, we'll be working and praying diligently to technically reconfigure the presentations. But they will continue, but in a different format and configured differently technically. Our profound apologies to people that have not been notified, that have had a hard time getting on Zoom. Zoom has been another problem. They set limits as to how many people can get on Zoom, and you have to keep paying to get it expanded, which we're willing to do. But thank you. You're welcome. Please close I'm the. Uh, please close the microphones. Mute the microphones. Thank you. So we're going to have to just go back to step one. We hope to see you all on Wednesday, the third of March. Same time, but with a different technical configuration. Something else we're going to begin next month. We don't know exactly when next month. We've talked about doing Sunday teachings. This is a problem because we have people who watch 
in Australia, people who watch in the States and the West Coast of America, the East Coast of America, people who watch in Britain and Europe. It's very difficult to get a time slot where all these people can watch it unless they watch the film video of it afterwards, post facto. Um, so we're looking at a Sunday as a possibility. There'll be Sunday morning in the West Coast of America, Sunday morning in the East Coast, and then Sunday, late Sunday afternoon in, in Great Britain. The problem with that is we don't want to conflict with people's churches. Some churches in America are still meeting. Some churches are meeting by Zoom. We don't want to take people away from their own churches. So how do we do this? We're not sure yet. We may do it on a Saturday instead of a Sunday. We may do it on a Saturday instead of a Sunday because the last thing we want to do is hurt church attendance or even Zoom attendance of churches that are teaching the Word of God. We're in competition with the devil. We're not in competition with other believers and ministries and congregations that are trying to serve Jesus and help people. So that'll begin sometime next month. We just don't have the details as to even what day it's going to be as yet. But that will begin, and it will be different than the Wednesday night. It will not be Wednesday night. It'll be something completely different. What we're going to do, in part, is take things that were badly recorded in the days of videos and cassettes, update them and re-record them in higher definition and better quality. We're going to begin with new, with uh, renewing older teachings that people, that people always ask about. The first one is going to be the first one is going to be the divine aristocracy. That will likely be the first one, the divine aristocracy. Um, the next Bible study we will have on the 3rd of March, on the Wednesday when we recommence, will likely be from Colossians, from Colossians. But people will be notified by um, email, and there will be adverts on Moriel TV and on announcements on Moriel Facebook and Moriel.org website, and it'll be out there. It will also be announced by RTN, of course. So that will recommence the 3rd of March. We don't know the weekend meetings, but sometime in March we hope to be ready. That's still in the planning stage. We're still seeking the Lord about certain things. Once again, our apologies for all the technical glitches and hiccups. It has been endless. Amos has put hours a day in. And when you put hours a day into something and it doesn't improve, you know you have a problem. Well, we certainly have a problem. It's time to uh, let it die and begin over. So we hope to see you next month. In the meantime, let's continue. This will be our final teaching on this series of Elijah and the Olivet Discourse. Until now, we've been pointing out repeatedly that there are multiple aspects of the saga and epic of Elijah, Eliyahu Hanavi. We looked in James and we saw that it has a practical relevance for the church and for believers today and for the church, not just for Israel. We are told in the epistle of James chapter 5. Obviously, it had a meaning for that time, historically, in Israel's history, in the ten northern tribes during the reign of Ahab and Jezebel. That is also obvious. Then we talked about how he was prophesying and sometimes typologically um, foreshadowing the first coming of Jesus, the first coming of the Messiah. And then we talked about how it is also prophetic, eschatologically, if you want to use that term, for the last days or the return of Christ. And that's mainly what we're going to begin looking at tonight, or we're going to look at tonight. We're going to look at Elijah for the future. Not reiterating the things we've already said, that when Jesus pointed out Elijah will come, or that Malachi said he will come before the day of the Lord, we want to go into more detail. It's going to be a different kind of approach tonight, but we really want to look at what the ministry of Elijah 
means in some way for the future. With this in view, turn with me, please. First of all, before we go to Kings, to the book of Daniel. The book of Daniel chapter 12. At the end of Daniel, verses 11 and 12, from the time that the regular sacrifice is abolished and the abomination of desolation is set up, there will be 1,290 days. How blessed is he who keeps waiting and attains to the 1,335 days, a 45-day period beyond that. But as for you, go your way to the end. Then you will enter into rest and rise again for your allotted portion at the end of the age. This, of course, being a personal message to the prophet Daniel himself. Now, notice something. We talk in Daniel and in Revelation about two times time and a half time. Two times time and a half time. Three and a half years by the lunar calendar. We've talked about this already. And we've talked about how both testaments divided into two halves. Revelation does, the Old Testament, the Hebrew Scriptures do. And we talk about the fact that it's mentioned in James, it's mentioned in Revelation, obviously in Daniel, but also in Kings concerning Elijah. So it is in multiple places, in multiple books. One of the basic premises of biblical interpretation hermeneutically is this. Again, we've said this many times, but we have some new people, so we'll say it one more time. Everything in God's word is important. There's nothing in scripture that's not important. Everything is important. But not all things are of equal importance. Jesus made this clear when he spoke of things like the weightier matters of the law, and he warned about those who would strain a gnat and swallow a camel. It's all important, but it's not all co-equally important. Some things are more important than others. One of the simplest ways to understand this is the following. One of the ways. There are other criteria, but one of the ways is this for purposes of biblical interpretation. If something is mentioned in Scripture one time, it's important. If it's mentioned two times, it's more important. If it's mentioned three times, it's more important still. If it's mentioned four times, it's ultra important. And if it's in both Testaments, it's five stars. The more times the Holy Spirit inspired something to be included in Scripture, the more important it is. Now, this encompasses a wide variety of doctrines and themes and narratives, a wide variety. But right now we're looking at the return of Christ in relation to the prophet Elijah and the prophet Elijah in relation to the return of Christ. And so we have this period of half of seven years in Daniel. We certainly have it in Elijah's historical narrative in Kings. We have it mentioned in James, and we have it in the book of Revelation. And as we talked about, when you see 1,260 it means something God is doing. When you see it as like 42 months, it's something the devil's doing, okay? It's something bad. Same amount of time. But when it's described as 42 months, it's described that way for a certain reason. And when it's described as 1,260, it's described that way for another reason. 
However, when we look at Daniel 12, the conclusion of Daniel, where this whole concept is really formulated, when we look at Daniel, Daniel closes not by saying the second half is 1260, but that the second half is 1290, not 1260, 1290, followed by another 45-day period after the seven years. What is this? Why is this? In the Hebrew festal calendar of the Jewish feasts, okay, you have the outline of God's plan for salvation. It's called Heilsgeschichte in German by theologians. But their calendar was neither strictly lunar nor strictly solar. It was solar lunar. The Hebrew calendar is lunar with some elements of solar. Uh, that may have been God's providence because he knew the Gentile church would come and have a Gregorian or Julian calendar at some future point, and he wanted it to be significant for both the Gentile nations and for Israel. That may be the reason, it may be God's providence, that the Hebrews did not have strictly lunar, but they had lunar slash solar. In the Hebrew calendar, every three years or so, you have a kind of leap year where the differences are reconciled with the lunar phases. You have two months of Adar. Adar roughly corresponds to February. This is Adar. Right now in the Hebrew calendar, it's Adar. And it is where and when Sorry, it is when the Feast of Purim, the Feast of Esther, is celebrated. If it is a month, a year rather, with two months of Adar, Purim is later. If it's a year where there's only one month of Adar, Purim is earlier, like this year. So you add an extra month. We have no problem understanding then the 1260 and the 1290, why there's an extra month. It is essentially mathematically immaterial whether you say there's an extra month at the beginning or an extra month at the end, that doesn't matter. What does matter is Daniel makes it clear that unlike the first half, which is 1260 days, the second is 1290 there's an additional 30 days. Three and a half years, 42 months, 1,260 days, 1,290 days. And then the 1335, which most people believe, and I would tend to agree, marks the commencement of the millennial reign of Christ. Blessed is he who attains to it. Okay. Now, we did this in Holland, uh, for Holland, last Sunday. We're going to do it again in, in, in English um, with somewhat more technical emphasis tonight. Let's look now, with these things in view, at 1 Kings chapter 19. What happens after the three and a half years? We don't base doctrine on type, but the typology illustrates the doctrine. Notice after the three and a half years, Elijah's ministry did not end abruptly. He was raptured at a later point after facing notorious persecution. Now Ahab and Jezebel
You muted, Jacob. Jacob, your microphone is muted. Can you unmute your microphone, brother? Why did it mute? Should I say what I just said over? Just repeat from the reading the scripture, Jacob. That'd be very much helpful. Thank you. What chapter again? I'm sorry. First Kings 19. We'll begin over. Now Ahab told Jezebel all Elijah had done and how he had killed all the prophets with the sword. Now all the prophets would suggest on its own that he killed the prophets both of Baal and of Asherah. But that becomes a question. Then Jezebel sent a messenger to Elijah saying, so may the gods do to me and more if I do not make your life as the life of one of them by tomorrow about this time. And he was afraid and arose and ran for his life and came to Beersheba, which belongs to Judah, and left his servant there. But he himself went a day's journey into the wilderness and came and sat down under a juniper tree and requested for himself that he might die, and said, It is enough. Now, O Lord, take my life. I'm not better than my father's. And he lay down and slept under a juniper tree, and behold, there was an angel touching him, and he said to him, Arise, eat. Then he looked, and behold, there was at his, his head a bread cake baked on hot stones and a jar of water. So he ate and drank and laid down again. And the angel of the Lord, the angel of the Lord, definite article, this would be a Christophany, an Old Testament appearance of Christ, who in Judaism, the rabbis referred to him as the Metatron, except they don't recognize him as Jesus. But in Judaism, he's called Metatron, we know it's a Christophany, the angel of the Lord with a definite article. An angel of the Lord is one thing. The angel of the Lord, such as who wrestled with Jacob, is a Christophany, an Old Testament appearance of Christ. Okay. So it continues. The angel came, and it happens a second time. He ate and drank, laid down. The angel came again a second time and touched him and said, Arise and eat, because the journey is too great for you. For he arose and ate and drank and went in the strength of that food 40 days and 40 nights to Horeb, the mountain of God. Then he came to a cave and lodged there. And behold, the word of the Lord came to him, and he said to him, What are you doing here, Elijah? And he said, I've been very zealous for the Lord, the God of hosts. For the sons of Israel have forsaken your covenant, torn down your altars, and killed your prophets with the sword. I alone am left, and they seek my life to take it away. Notice a period of very intense persecution a death sentence at the hands of Jezebel and Ahab. So he said, go forth and stand on the mountain before the Lord. And behold, the Lord was passing by and a great throng, a, a great strong wind was rending the mountains and breaking in pieces the rocks before the Lord. But the Lord was not in the wind. And after the wind, an earthquake, but the Lord was not in the earthquake. And after the earthquake, a fire. So we have earth, wind, and fire. But the Lord was not in the fire. And after the fire, a sound of gentle blowing. And when Elijah heard it, he wrapped his face in his mantle and went out and stood in the entrance of the cave. And behold, a voice came to him and said, what are you doing here, Elijah? And then he said, I have been very zealous for the Lord, the God of hosts, for the sons of Israel have forsaken your covenant, torn down your altars, killed your prophets with the sword, and I alone am left, 
and may seek my life to take it away. And the Lord said to him, go return on your way to the wilderness of Damascus. And when you have arrived, you shall anoint Hazel king over Aram and Jehu, the son of Nimshi. You shall anoint king over Israel and Elisha, the son of Shaphat of Abel Mohia, you shall anoint as a prophet in your place. Notice a Gentile king, a Jewish king, and Elisha, who would have the same spirit of Elijah and John the Baptist in double portion. And it becomes one of the reasons people speculate that one of the two witnesses is Elisha. Others say it's the Apostle John in the Middle East. Most commonly, people would say it is either Moses or Enoch. Remember, there are multiple identifications assigned by different people. There's no consensus, except that they correspond to the two olive trees in the book of Zechariah, which we'll be looking at. Now, let's look. I alone am left. I'm the only one. <sighs> happens again. I've been very zealous for the Lord, but they've forsaken your covenants, your prophets, with the sword they killed. The Lord said to him, go return on your way to the wilderness of Damascus. When you arrive, you shall anoint Hazael king of Aram, Jehu the son of Nimshi, king over Israel, and Elisha the son of Shaphat, of Abel Maholat, you shall anoint as prophet in your place. It still came about, the one who escapes from the sword of Hezael, Jehu shall put to death. If the Gentiles don't kill him, the Jews will. And the one who escapes from the sword of Jehu, Elijah shall put to death. Yet I will leave 7,000 in Israel. All the knees that have not bowed to Baal and every mouth that has not kissed him. Please note these details. So he departed from there and found Elisha, the son of Shaphat, while he was plowing with 12 pairs of oxen before him. And he with the 12th. Remember, when you see this 12, it always has a correspondence to the number of the tribes and apostles and so forth. And Elijah passed over to him and threw his mantle on him. Notice the mantles mentioned twice. He left the oxen and ran after Elijah and said, please let me kiss my father and mother, then I will follow you. And he said to him, go back again for what have I done to you? So he returned from following him and took the pair of oxen and sacrificed them and boiled their flesh with the implements of the oxen. Uh, and he gave it to the people and they ate. Then he arose and followed Elijah and ministered to him. Let's look at the features of this. First of all, Jezebel and Ahab remain active. The 1260 days do not end everything. Now, what does that impart tell us? It impart tells us that the ministry of Elijah in Revelation 11, however we understand that, appears to be the first half of the seven years. The first half of the seven years. 1260, okay? If it was the second half, it would have to go to 1290, wouldn't it? Additionally, things happen afterwards. So let's continue to look. Once more, Chapter 19, the prophets, are they the same prophets or are they different ones? When we go ahead, we see there was another prophet that God raised up to confront Ahab. 
it was not only Eliyahu HaTishbi, Elijah the Tishbite. There was another prophet named Micaiah. Micaiah, who means like unto Yahweh. And Micaiah confronted the priests of Jezebel and predicted her destruction. She would be killed, of course, by Jehu. But in this text, we read that there were 400 priests uh, or prophets. There were 400 prophets. So the question happens now, did Elijah only kill the prophets of Baal and allow the prophets of Asherah to escape? And then they come back later in the confrontation with Micaiah. Remember, although God used Elijah and he even thought he was the only one, there were other prophetic voices who were active, not only him. Understand this. When people, anyone, even if they seem to be teaching or expounding the truth, set themselves up and say, I'm the one who's holding all the cards. I'm the one who's got it. I'm the one who God has appointed for this time. And that's cultic. Be careful. That's spiritual pride. Every cult begins that way. Sometimes they begin by Satan getting to somebody who began right. Examples, the closed brethren, John Darby. That's an example. Among people who are evangelicals. That's why Charles Spurgeon and other people, George Mueller warned against Darby. It became a cult. If you see the closed brethren today and around England and places like that, they're a cult. They destroy families. They think they're the only ones who has the truth. They get into what's known as the sin of party spirit. Be very careful. Jacob Prash does not have a monopoly on light. Jacob Prash does not have a monopoly on truth. Our ministry does not even have members or a membership. We have churches affiliated with us who have members, members, but they're only affiliated with us. I'm no pope. I'm not, I'm not, we're not hierarchical. The only one who's above everyone is Jesus. Okay. Uh, be careful when you see somebody who claims to be the spokesman. The Jehovah's Witnesses were that, with, with Charles Tazzy Russell. The Mormons were that, with Joseph Smith and then Brigham Young. Obviously Islam, and of course Roman Catholicism is based on a monarchical papacy who claims to be from the chair of Peter and infallible when he speaks ex cathedra. All of that is cultic. Not only is it cultic, it is insidious because there is an antichrist spirit under it and on back of it. It's putting a man in the place of Christ. The only one holding all the cards is Jesus. He may give me a king. He may give you a king or somebody else an ace or give us an ace or somebody. You can. Only Jesus holds all the cards. Be very very careful when somebody sets themselves up and makes themselves the plumb line for everyone else or the guru. That is a Hinduistic concept. That is a Roman Catholic concept, but it is not a scriptural concept. Now, I've warned many times on one of our teachings, uh, Phases to Freedom, we talk about this. When you see a leader getting into this, you're going to find three things you'll find three things beginning to happen. One, you're going to find exploitation. There'll be some kind of financial exploitation. Second, you will find sexploitation. There'll be some kind of sexual immorality. Third, to have that kind of power over people is not scriptural and it's not natural. And these guys become predatory with what Paul says. They take captive weak-willed women and things like this. Third, 
in addition to exploitation and sexploitation, perhaps most seriously, you find textploitation. They begin to doctrinally corrupt the word of God. God may be using a person at a particular time. He may be blessing and using that person. Praise God for that person. May the Lord keep him faithful. May the Lord use him or her. May the Lord use them. But there's no one man shows. <laughs> there's no one man shows. I thank God for the brothers I've known. I thank God for the people who I've known who have taught the truth from Martin Lloyd-Jones and, and G. Campbell Morgan and Dave Hunt. And, did we agree on every point, David Pawson? No, there, there'd be occasional point, but we disagreed. David Wilkerson, another one. There'd be occasional points where we disagreed. But I, if anyone sets themselves up as the gold standard, it's gold-plated. <laughs> it's, it's not the real thing. We've never had any members. No, we had a membership. Yet this, this hired liar, liar for hire, he actually said things <laughs> about me, one of which that I was a cult leader, uh, a cult that, that abuses its members. We don't have any members. <laughs> this is the kind of thing you get. So we see Elijah was ministering, but God was also speaking through Micaiah. And we see that Jezebel still had 400 uh, prophets. Uh, now, were these 400 prophets the same as the prophets of Asherah? We cannot be sure. Verses 1 and 2 of chapter 19, where she says, may the gods, that would suggest polytheism. Okay, that would suggest polytheism, but and it just says all the says the prophets in, inclusively, but because the number is four hundred in the encounter with uh, Micaiah, that raises the specter that it may these prophets of Asherah may have escaped. Now let's understand something about Asherah. We've mentioned it in the past. Asherah is a female cult deity. Beginning at the Council of Ephesus in the 5th century, the attributes of these female cult deities, like Asherah, particularly, Minerva, Diana of Ephesus, they were ascribed to Mary. This idea of sacrificing cakes to the Queen of Heaven that we see in Jeremiah, The Mary you see in Roman Catholicism is not the Mary of Scripture. It's not the real Mary, Miriam. It's, it's, it's an Asherah. It's an Asherah. Now, let's continue. When we look at this, we also see mentioned in chapter 20, uh, verse 15 of the 7,000, of the 7,000. It mentions it more than once. These 7,000 become somehow very, well, for obvious reasons, very important. Notice Elijah goes to Beersheba where Abraham was. Goes to where Abraham was. Leaves his servant there. But even today in Israel, once you get past Beersheba, you're in the Negev. I did a bit of army training down there at a place called Stay Boca. There's nothing there. Once you get by Beersheba, there's practically nothing there, maybe a military installation or something like that, but there's practically nothing there. It is a barren, barren wilderness that joins with the, with the wilderness of Sinai. There's nothing there till you get to Eilat, to, to, to the Gulf of Aqaba. It's just a wilderness to this very day, that's where he flees. 
and he goes to Arabia. Okay. Now you see he's under the juniper tree. When you see somebody under a tree in scripture, it typologically means something. Different trees represent different things. In Jewish thought, the Eitz Hayim, the tree of life, is represented by a fig tree. Hence, when Jesus told Nathaniel, Nathaniel asked, how do you know? Because I saw you under the fig tree. I saw you under the tree of life. Those whom he foreknew from the foundation of the world. Jesus saw Nathaniel from the foundation of the world. If you're born again, if you're truly saved, the Lord Jesus saw you under the fig tree, as it were. Okay. The tree of destruction is the tamarisk tree. King Saul dwelt under the tamarisk tree. Noah dwelt under the castor tree. But here we see he's under the tree, juniper tree, which has something to do with despondency. Different trees represent different, dwelling under a tree, different trees appear to represent different spiritual and psychological states of the person dwelling under them, whether it be King Saul in the negative sense, whether it be Elijah. When you see somebody dwelling under a tree, notice what kind of a tree it is. <laughs> now I can talk more about this, but we're not going to today. Let's look even further. Before a flight, you see in scripture a common element, eating before you go, food for the road, eat before you get out of here. There's going to be something difficult coming and you're going to need to have the nutrition ahead of time. There'll be no way to get it then. You got to get it now. Before the Exodus, God told the Hebrews, eat the Pesach, eat the Paschal Seder. Then we get out of here. When they get into the Sinai, they went three days and three nights without food, didn't they? Before there's a flight into a wilderness, into a uncharted territory. There's not going to be any food there. Eat before you leave. Eat before you leave. The good and faithful servant gives the proper food at the proper time in the Olivet Discourse. God tells Elijah, or Jesus tells Elijah, of course he wasn't called Jesus then, but the Son of God tells Elijah, as the angel of the Lord, eat this. Eat this stuff before you go into the wilderness. Eat it. And he does. Bear in mind, you'll find that recurring. Then he goes to Horeb. Mount Sinai, hot, hot Horeb. I'm convinced based on Galatians and on other Geographical data is in Arabia. It's not the Sinai of St. Catherine's Monastery in, in, in the Sinai. It is in Arabia. Okay. He goes to where the Torah was given, to where the Decalogue was given. He goes to where God met Moses. And he even sees the Lord passing by, doesn't he? Same as Moses saw the Lord passing by from the back. Notice what happens to Moses, happens to Elijah. And he's there 40 days and 40 nights. How long did Moses spend on the mountain? 40 days and 40 nights. You see the same pattern. Jesus fasted 40 days and 40 nights. Remember, 40 is the number of divine testing. The number of divine testing. 
with Noah. 40 days and 40 nights, the faith of Noah and his family were being tested. 40. Jesus fast 40 days and 40 nights. The children of Israel sojourned 40 years in the wilderness. 40 is the number of divine testing. And as we usually point out, when you see the 40, the divine testing, it's not so God will know if we're going to be faithful or not. He already knows. He wants us to know. He wants us to know who is faithful and who isn't. <laughs> he wants us to know how strong or how weak we are. And he uses this season of testing to do it. The 40. There will be a 40 at the close of the age. Whether a literal 40 or not, that's another issue. But there will be a time of testing. There will be a time of testing. We are promised, however, that we will escape the wrath of God. Now, this relates also to the Greek word peresmos. I'm not going to go into that at the moment. He comes to the cave, and the word of the Lord came to him, what are you doing here, Elijah? <laughs> and he tells him, and he said, go forth, stand at the mountain before the Lord. So he goes back, and, and the Lord was passing by, just like with Moses. Then the phenomena happened, the earth the wind, and the fire. Remember, the word for spirit and wind is the same in Hebrew, ruach, but it was the gentle breeze, the gentle wind, where the Holy Spirit was, okay? At the end of the age, the cataclysms of the earthquakes and the judgments of fire and these natural disasters that are precipitated by man's sin and by the efforts of Antichrist to destroy the believers and to destroy Israel and the Jews. Those things, the strong wind, in other words, the torrential wind, the gale forces, and the earthquakes, the natural disasters, and the fires which could happen could have a volcanic uh, connotation. So seismological, possibly volcanic. Obviously, it's going to be things like Sodom and Gomorrah, that kind of fire. Those things concern God's dealing with the unsaved. Those things concern God's dealing with the unsaved. There will be loud, tumultuous upheavals. God's dealing with his people will be the gentle breeze, the peace that passes all understanding, even in an environment of calamity. Now let's continue to look at this. It all happens and he comes a second time. They killed all your prophets. With the sword, I alone am left, tells him. Well, God tells him, I have 7,000. Now, killing with the sword, typologically, and we're not basing doctrine again on type, could have to do with the word. But when it's the word of God, it's a two-edged sword. <laughs> Muslims decapitate people with a sword, not an ax that uses a sword. It's a one-edged sword. <laughs> when you see a two-edged sword, that's what's figurative of scripture. That's not what's talking about not what is being talking about here. Okay. Your covenants are torn down. They killed your prophets. And I've got 7,000. It is going to become so desperate. What we see now is a preview. 
people will come on to a Zoom Bible study like this one, and they'll see there are other Christians, other believers in other countries with similar experiences and similar concerns to their own, that they have common ground with believers in Canada or the States or Europe or South Africa or Australia or where Israel or wherever. They're going to be dispersed. The, seven, the faithful remnant will be a dispersed number. And again, they are repeated in chapter 20. Okay. Now, it goes on. Go to Damascus. I'm going to get you to anoint a king, Hazael, over Aram, the Aramites. And Jehu, the son of Nimshi, and then Elisha, Elisha. God appoints all leadership. There's no leadership that doesn't come to power that he doesn't allow it. But here he commissions it. Jehu is a unique person. Judah ended in corruption worse than Israel, worse than the 10 northern tribes. Under Zedekiah and Manasseh, it ended worse. But it had good kings like Josiah and Hezekiah and Asa. Judah also had a lot of good kings. From the time of Jeroboam to Jeroboam II, and of course Ahab, etc., every single king of Israel, of the ten northern tribes, every single one of them was a backslider. No exceptions, except Jehu. Now, he also messed up at the end of his life, unfortunately. Uh, the way King Joash did. He was good, and then he went off later, at a later point. But Jehu was the only one who stood on God's word and did God's will of the kings of Israel. He was God's assassin. He was commissioned as an assassin. He cut the heads off of these false prophets and put them in a basket, 70 of them, and things like this. And he did dramatic things. And he was responsible for the death of Jezebel. Can you imagine her head, her skull, and her hands, and a puddle of blood, and the dogs lapping it up? The judgment of Jezebel foreshadows the judgment of the wicked woman in Revelation. It foreshadows the judgment of the wicked woman in Revelation. Remember, Jesus said you tolerate the woman Jezebel, but then looking forward, we see the harlot in chapter 17 and 18. Now, let's go a bit further with this in chapter 19. I've been very zealous. Well, what was he zealous for? For the Lord of hosts, for the sons of Israel have forsaken the covenant. Laodicea is an age of lukewarmness. Those whom God is going to use at the close of the age will not have the spirit of the church of Laodicea. They will be zealous. Despite the circumstances they find themselves in, they will have a holy zeal. They will want Jesus to come. They will understand that God has placed them here at this time in history to prepare the way for the return of Christ. They will have a Holy Spirit-inspired zeal, despite the opposition. It happens. God tells them what to do. Now God steps in. So he departs. And he finds Elisha and anoints him and so forth. And the story of the 12 teams of oxen. Now, 
1260, 1290. Turn with me, please, to the book of Revelation, chapter 11. There was given to me a measuring rod like a staff, and someone said, get up and measure the temple of God and the altar and allow and those who worship in it. Leave out the court which is outside the temple and do not measure it, for it has been given to the nations, that is the ethnon, the Gentiles, and they will tread it underfoot, the holy city, for 42 months. Remember, 42 is always bad. Remember the 42 youths with the bears and Elisha? It connects. I'll grant authority to my witnesses and I'll prophesy 1260, not 1290, clothed in sackcloth. These are the two olive trees and two lampstands that stand before the Lord of the earth. If anyone wants to harm them, fire flows out of their mouth and devours their enemies. So if anyone wants to harm them, he must be killed in that way. Like Elijah, these have power to shut up the sky so that the rain will not fall during the days of their prophesying. And they have power over the waters to turn them into blood and to strike the earth with every plague as often as they desire. Notice they're like Moses and like Elijah. When they finished, and remember Elijah was like Moses, he went to Mount Horeb for 40 days and 40 nights. And they have power over these things. When they finish their testimony, the beast that comes out of the abyss, that is the Antichrist, will make war with them and overcome them and kill them. Their dead bodies will be in the streets of the great city, which mystically is called Sodom in Egypt, where also their Lord was crucified, Sodom and Egypt. Jerusalem is where Satan got his biggest defeat. Jerusalem is where Satan will get his final defeat. The Antichrist will set up the image in the temple. There are those who have suggested or speculated that the reason the Antichrist will have no love for women is that he will be a homosexual. Hence, they relate that to Sodom and Egypt, Egypt being a figure of the world. One of the largest homosexual festivals in the world, and it's not a lot of Israelis, it's people coming from other countries, is held in Israel, it's held in Jerusalem, uh, Tel Aviv. For political reasons, they can't do it in Jerusalem, but eventually they're going to. We did a teaching called Not Even a Minyan, and we talked about how the rescue of Lot is a figure of the rapture and how militant homosexuality is going to increase radically and drastically before the Lord comes, and that's certainly happening now. You had a transgender male athlete with male <laughs> chromosomes, a chromosomal male, who had himself surgically mutilated to resemble a woman, claiming to be a woman, and under Biden, Joe Biden's executive order, is allowed to compete as a woman against women. And this is last week, he crushed the head of a woman in a karate match, in a martial arts match. He crushed her skull and he's being celebrated as a hero. 
by members of the homosexual community saying how he stood up to bigotry and prejudice against trans gender people and he overcame the transphobia to become a karate champion. He's a guy. He has naturally bigger orthomusculature and he crushed a girl's head. And they celebrate. This is how sick it's become. But it's not just that community. It's the president of the United States, a son of Satan, a man given over to hell. The sins of Sodom. Sodom and Egypt, where our Lord was also crucified. We once had a person on our council of reference in Australia who we got rid of. Unfortunately, he represents Bill Randall's ministry in Australia. And he actually teaches that the two witnesses, these two witnesses, get this, are God the Father and God the Holy Spirit, who, like Jesus, must come in human form and die in Jerusalem. Where, the, where their Lord was also crucified. How can Jesus be the Lord of his Father? He teaches this stuff. He actually teaches it. We got rid of him. Bill Randall thinks he's the greatest thing since sliced bread. That doesn't matter that he teaches this. Um, Bill Randall has gone so far away from the Word of God, it's unbelievable to have people like this. Can you imagine? This person says Jesus only completed his own role. Now the Father and the Holy Spirit have to come and die the way Jesus did. These are two ancient heresies. He has his own spin or his own version of it, but it's two ancient heresies, Patripassianism and Pneumopassianism. It's not just the Son, but the Father and the Spirit have to undergo this in some salvific way. These, these were heresies in the early church repackaged. And that, that, that's who Bill Randalls is representing. I mean, it was, it's terrible. It is absolutely terrible. That's not a personal attack. I'm just stating a fact. No, these two witnesses are not God the Father and God the Holy Spirit, and they don't have to come and die in Jerusalem the way Jesus did. That is complete and utter nonsense. Now, I don't say Bill Randalls believes it himself, but he gives platform to people who do, to someone who does and lets them represent his ministry. He just doesn't care. He just doesn't care anymore. Well, let's look at this. When these two guys are killed by the Antichrist, people celebrate. They give presents. Some theorize this may be at Christmas time with the giving of the gifts. What we see here is they had this power and they were invincible. They couldn't be destroyed. They could call down the judgment of God on these wicked things, and if anybody tried to stop them, they'd be in trouble. Until the Antichrist comes into full power. At the end of the 1,260 days, he assumes full power. Okay. After three and a half days, they, of course, raise from the dead. But they first stand on their feet. They first stand on their feet. And then there's a loud voice come up here. Notice something. The resurrection, the dead in Christ rise first and we meet them in the air, that's true. But they have the nature that we have. Our book, Harpezo, which deals with the subject of the rapture, opens with the account of of what happened on the Mount of Transfiguration, which was Mount Hermon, Har Hermon. 
you had Elijah, a man who was raptured in a chariot. He was raptured. Moses, a man who died faithful to God biologically on Mount Nebo, on the heart of Nebo. But they both appeared and looked exactly the same as Jesus. It doesn't matter if you die in Christ or if you're raptured and you're in Christ. When he comes, we shall be as he is, all the same, glorified bodies. But notice these chaps, these two witnesses, come alive first and stand on the earth before come up here. The dead in Christ rise first. Come up here, we meet them in the air. Now let's go back to the time of the crucifixion of Jesus. When Jesus gave up the ghost, he entered the holy place as our high priest. That is why the temple veil was torn on earth. It was a reflection of what was happening in the heavenlies, according to the epistle to the Hebrews. Sinful man was no longer separated from a holy God. The Old Testament saints could not be saved by the blood of animals. The blood of those animals, particularly the Yom Kippur, the goat at Yom Kippur, made kapora, kapora, Yom Kippur, kapora, same root. This kind of blood sacrifice was a temporary covering of the sin of of the faithful saints of the Old Testament. It was a temporary covering until the Messiah came and removed the sin. <laughs> the goats, one goat was a type of Satan, the Ezazel, the other a type of Christ, okay, but it only made kapura. If a Hebrew had real faith and sincere repentance, he'd have kapura. Those who died faithful to God under the Torah, under the law, before Jesus came would have kapora, a temporary covering until the Messiah came and removed the sin. Only the blood of Jesus can take away the sin. We're told the blood of animals can't do that. Now, there's another false teacher who our ministry got rid of when we found out what he was teaching. He's promoted by Studio Scotland and by Deborah and Stuart Menelaus and Bethel called David Nathan. He actually teaches it's possible for the blood of animals to take away sin, even though scripture says it can't, and that in the millennium, that's how sin is going to be forgiven, by the blood of animals. He actually teaches this. Uh, David Nathan grew up Orthodox Jew, uh, but he's, he's he was the uh, showpiece for the studio Scotland, the Menelaus. And they promoted him, and for months and months and months on their website, they had this false gospel, a absolutely false gospel. The blood of animals cannot take away sin. So what happened to the Old Testament saints who died, and they had kapora, a temporary covering until the Messiah came? In the netherworld, Sheol, which the Greeks called Hades, they were not in the place of condemnation. They were in the place called the bosom of Abraham, the bosom of Abraham, waiting for the Messiah to come. When the Lord Jesus died, he descended into the bosom of Abraham. Now, unfortunately, the King James Bible too often mistranslates Hades as hell. So they say he descended into hell. The word faith money preachers, led by Kenneth Hagen, followed by Kenneth Copeland, and then people like Joyce Meyer after that, in the first edition of her first book, they had this doctrine that Jesus died spiritually. That although on the cross he said, it is finished, Father, into your hands I give my spirit. No, he went to hell and he was tortured three days and three nights by Satan after he became one nature with the devil. And then Jesus had to be born again in hell. This doctrine goes back to people 
like William Branham and somebody called E.W. Kenyon, total heretics. But that's where the word faith money preachers got this. So because the cross of Jesus is not central to their view of salvation or the Christian life, neither is the cross of Jesus essential for us. Please mute the microphones. Because the cross of Jesus is not central to their view of the gospel, neither is it central to their view of discipleship. Instead of pick up your cross and follow me, it becomes you're a king's kid, name it and claim it. God wants you rich, blab it and grab it. We've explained these things before. No, Jesus did not descend into hell. That's based on a mistranslation in the King James. He went into Hades to the bosom of Abraham, and he was revealed to Old Testament saints. What happened to them? They were seen walking around Jerusalem, weren't they? In Matthew 27. <laughs> At the rapture, the people who come out of their graves will literally physically come out of the graves. They will be organically and structurally reconstituted into living people. They will have the kind of body that Jesus had after his resurrection. They were seen walking around in Jerusalem. It's what we read in the book of Joel. Even if my flesh is decayed, I know my Redeemer liveth. He will take a stand on the earth in the last days. With my own flesh shall I see God. These people who die, who died under the law with their own eye, <laughs> those saints who give up the ghost, their spirit is in paradise. But when they are reunited with their body, they come out of the grave with their own eye. They will biologically be alive again the way those saints were in Matthew's gospel. So it's not like we're caught up physically and then they just zip up. No. <laughs> they take their stand on the earth, then they're zipped up. Now, it happens very quickly in the instant, in the blinking of an eye. <laughs> happens very quickly. But it happens. That's what happened when he came the first time. It's what happens when he comes again. But we see the pattern with these two witnesses. Now the situation begins to raise various questions. I had a question last week from Petia Ayatova. Petia, are you here? Can you unmute for a second and say? Yes, I'm here. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Petya is my uh, Petya does most of the Russian translating for Moriel outside of Israel. We have somebody else who does it in Israel, but in, outside of Israel, she's our Russian translator. Anyway, uh, she asked a very good question. If the rapture is between the sixth and seventh seal. Okay. If the rapture is between the sixth and the seventh seal, that's that's when it is. How can it be that these two witnesses are resurrected between the sixth and seventh trumpet at a much later point? If it's 1260 days and the rapture happens at some point after the 1260 days, but it happens between the sixth and seventh seal, how do you account for the fact that these guys are resurrected between the sixth and seventh trumpet? That assumes 
that the 1260 ended their lifespan. The text does not say that. Now pay attention, I know most of you know this. The sevens, the sets of seven in Revelation are always sequential, even the seven churches. They're a ge geographical loop and they represent seven ages and so forth. But the seven seals are sequential. The fourth is followed by the fifth, the fifth is followed by the sixth, the sixth is followed by the seventh. The third trumpet's followed by the fourth, which is the which is the uh, last of the ordinary trumpets, and then comes the three woes, five, six, and seven. And then you have the seven peals of thunder, and you have the seven uh, vials. The third is followed by the fourth, the fourth by the fifth. They're all sequential. The trumpets, the seven trumpets, come out of the seventh seal. So therefore, the trumpets must follow the seals. They cannot be concurrent. They cannot be concurrent. Some people have tried to make these judgments concurrent. It's nonsense. They're sequential. However, we also see something else. Between the sixth and the seventh, you always see an interlude. Between the sixth and seventh seal, you see an interlude when the rapture happens. You see an interlude between the sixth and seventh vial, not our subject tonight, but you see an interlude here between the sixth and the seventh trumpet. Something always happens between the sixth and the seventh. This is in our book, Har Peso. It is at this time where you have the first woe preceding the interlude, the second woe during the interlude, and then, you know, happening then, the sixth, and then the seventh is, is the third woe. These are the three woes. So how can it be then, if they're around 1260, can they be resurrected, killed and resurrected much later, or at least sometime later, between the sixth and seventh trumpet? The text does not state that they were killed after the time of their ministry after the 1,260 in verse 3. It says that instead there was a period with these two olive trees, and when they finish their testimony, the beast comes after them, and he makes war with them. There is a period of conflict, of war with them after the 1260. Their ministry ends with the 1260, but not their life. Just like Elijah. Remember Elijah? After the 1260, the ministry ended. But his life didn't. He was raptured at a later point. It doesn't say that they were raptured at the end of the, of the 1260, that that's when it happens. No, the 1260 only refers to what they were doing. I hope that's clear enough, that at the end of the 1260, which ends between the 6th and 7th, sometime around the 6th seal, in, in chapter 6, that's the first half, ending around there. But they're not killed and resurrected until a later point. It's sometime after their ministry was completed. There's a war. Just like Jezebel and Ahab made war against Elijah after the 1260. 
What did happen is what's going to happen. The next thing we see in Revelation 11 is the following. When the judgment comes, this judgment is incredible. This judgment is a reversal of what happened in the ministry of Elijah. The exact diametric opposite happens. Look at verse 13. In that hour, there was a great earthquake, and a tenth of the city fell. 7,000 were killed in the earthquake. The rest were terrified and gave glory to the God of heaven. In Kings, in the days of Elijah, 7,000 did repent. The rest of them didn't. In Revelation, it's the opposite. 7,000 didn't repent and get destroyed. The rest did. It's the diametric opposite. It flips what happens in 1 Kings is reversed in Revelation. You've got the 7,000 in Kings, chapter 19, and in chapter 20. You also have Paul referring to them in Romans very quickly. Turn with me to Romans chapter 11. Verse 4, but what is the divine response to him? That is to Elijah. I've kept for myself 7,000 men who've not bowed the knee to Baal. You've got it in Kings 19, Kings 20. Not that there's chapter divisions in the original, but you've got it twice, at least twice in Kings. Then you have it in the New Testament, the 7,000 in Romans, it's mentioned again. And then you have it in Revelation. The more times something is in Scripture, the more important it is. And if it's in both Testaments, put an asterisk next to it or highlight it and underline it. It's important. Revelation 11 is the reversal of what happened in 1 Kings 19 and 20. Okay. They are the two olive branches. Turn with me, of course, as we know, to the book of Zechariah. In Zechariah chapter 12, we see there's some kind of a repentance in Jerusalem in verse 10 when they look upon him who they have pierced. We see that in Zechariah 12.10. That obviously speaks of an apparition of Jesus that is also referred to in Revelation 1.7. However, what we see also in Zechariah are the two olive branches. Now, somehow, they have a correspondence to Zerubbabel and Yeshua. Not Jesus Yeshua, but Yeshua, also known as Joshua, the high priest, and Zerubbabel, who was the civil leader. Okay. Verse 11 of chapter 4. Then I said to him, what are these two olive trees on the right hand of the lampstand on its left? And I answered the second time and said to him, what are the two olive branches, which are beside the two golden pipes, which empty the golden oil from themselves? Again, all these things have symbolic meanings. So he answered me and said, 
Do you not know what these are? No, my Lord. And he said, these are the two anointed ones who are standing by the Lord of the whole earth. We can be sure that these two are the two witnesses, not God the Father and God the Holy Spirit like Bill Randall's man in Australia teaches. And we see that God has anointed them for a special purpose. And in some way they correspond or they're represented by Zerubbabel, the civil leader, and by Yeshua, the priest. Okay. Could this suggest, and I ask the question here, maybe I digress, and I'm not wanting to over-speculate, I only mentioned it in passing. Could this mean that one of these two witnesses in the spirit of Elijah, prophesies to the civil government authorities headed by the Antichrist, the beast from the sea, while the other prophesies to the corrupt religious authorities headed by the false prophet, the beast from the earth. I am not at this point sure. I'm simply asking the question. I hope I'm not confusing anyone or giving place to undue speculation. But we do know that there is some correspondence, something about these two witnesses who appear as the two olive branches in Zechariah 4 that are reflected in the ministry and character of Zerubbabel, who is the political leader, and of Yeshua. And it's interesting, he's called by the, by the post-exilic name of Joshua, Yeshua, same as Jesus, and Joshua, Yehoshua. Again, I'm not being dogmatic about this, I'm only raising the question. It's one of the things I'm trying to deal with. Unfortunately, I'm not that enlightened and I'm not that clever. I don't understand it yet. I hope the Lord shows me. Now, we also see later in Zechariah that there's a repentance in Jerusalem. So too with these two witnesses, there's a repentance in Jerusalem after the 7,000 who don't repent are killed in the earthquake. Now, from chapter 12 through chapter 16, we have a hiatus. They retell a story from a different perspective. It would appear that the previous chapters describe events from the viewpoint of someone looking at the earth even though John's told to come up here, it's something to do with the viewpoint of the earth. These seals and these trumpets, they speak about events on the earth. Chapter 12 of Revelation <laughs> changes the perspective. It tends to look at things from a heavenly as well as an earthly perspective. Now, there is heavenly perspective in the previous chapters, but it seems to have a stronger earthly perspective because these are events happening on earth. In chapters 12, 13, and 14, 
the events on earth are viewed from the perspective of heaven, such as the reapers and the the uh, pronounced doom of those who worship the beast and so forth. Now, I hope I'm not confusing you. Let's understand this. The woman who represents Israel gives birth to the child. She gave birth to a son, a male child, who's to rule the nations. But this opens up with a picture of a vision that is similar to what Joseph saw in the book of Genesis, the woman with the stars. Okay. Of course, Joseph being a type of Christ. The red dragon, another sign appeared in heaven. Now a sign appears in heaven, and a red dragon having seven heads and ten horns. This is straight out of the book of Daniel. So we know it has a future meaning. It's from the book of Daniel. Okay. Remember, as we talked about on the Nativity teaching, which we have on Moriel TV, there was a sign at his first coming that the wise men knew, and there'll be a sign of the Son of Man in the heavens at his second coming, Jesus said. Well, you see that sign here. But then there's another sign. You always see this. She gave birth to a son, a male child, who's to rule the nations with a rod of iron. That is the Peshit interpretation, obviously, of Jesus. But it is not the Pesher, because this baby was caught up to heaven. When Jesus was rescued from the dragon, that is Herod, the dragon is in the character of Herod, a type of the Antichrist, as we explain on the Nativity vision, he was taken to Egypt. It must have a future meaning. Likewise, in Daniel 7.21, the dominion of the kingdom of Antichrist will be taken and given to the saints of the Most High. Now remember, chapter 12 opens with Daniel 7, the seven heads and the ten horns. And that same chapter says, dominion will be given to the saints of the Most High. So we have a basis in which to say that although it replays the nativity narrative, as the peshit, the pesher is something for the future. In the character of Herod, when the baby is rescued, the dragon makes war with the rest of her offspring, the way that Herod went back and killed the holy innocents, the babies in Bethlehem. I refer you to the nativity teaching, uh, Hanukkah, Christmas, and the return of Christ, if you don't know what I'm talking about, I'm only touching on it here. But this replays the Christmas story, but it has a future meaning. The woman, however, is taken into the wilderness for 1,260 days. Obviously, this is the second half of the tribulation. Oh, I'm sorry, I shouldn't call it the tribulation. This is the second half of Daniel's 70th week. The entire seven years is not the tribulation. The tribulation is a part of it. However, although she's taken into the wilderness for 1260, and remember, Elijah fled to the wilderness, didn't he? From Beersheba. Though the woman is taken into the wilderness, it's for 1260 days. 
We're missing 30 days somewhere. We're missing 30 days because it's 1290. Now, it may be, in fact, I'd be surprised if it isn't the case, that the amount of time that Jesus spent in Egypt was three and a half years as a baby. I'd be surprised that that was not the case. However, the woman who is Israel and the rest of her offspring flee to the wilderness. Many believers have often said that they think this is a flight to Petra. Petra, also known as Basra. We see the Lord returning by way of Mount Sa'ir in Jordan, which is overlooking the area of Basra. And major things happen there with the story of Moses and, and the end of the Exodus before entering the Promised Land under Joshua. Mount Sa'ir was important. And we see, send the tribute lamb in Isaiah 16. The Lord will come back via that way. He'll come back to that region or via that region. His feet will ultimately stand on the Mount of Olives, but he'll come that way. Now, Zechariah 12 and Zechariah 13 are not the same thing. Uh, his feet do not stand on the Mount of Olives in chapter 12. That happens at a later point, and two-thirds of the Jews are killed in the war with the Antichrist. But there is a flight to Petra, as is commonly believed. That's what most people who've looked at this think. I would not dispute it. I wouldn't be 100% dogmatic about it, but I wouldn't dispute it. It has some correspondence to what happened in 70 AD when the believers fled Jerusalem to, Petra, to Pila, not Petra, but Pila. In any event, this would seem to add up because Daniel tells us that portions of Jordan, Edom, Southern Jordan, where Petra is, Moab, Central Jordan, where Mount Nebo, Har Nebo, where Moses is buried, and so the promised land is, that most of Jordan, at least most of Western Jordan, somehow manages to evade the domain of Antichrist. Somehow it manages not to be under his thumb or control. Hence, they flee there for 1260 days. So, if in, now remember, once the church is, well, the church won't exist as such, once the faithful believers are removed, God primarily turns his focus back to dealing with Israel and the Jews. The doctrine of the tribulation saints is widely overstated. Most of what scripture, particularly the book of Revelation, indicates is that once the believers are removed <coughs> in the rapture and resurrection, the parousia, God's purposes return to dealing with Israel and the Jews. We have other teachings addressing this. So the woman escapes 1,260 days. But how does that jibe with 1,290? It doesn't. Some people, including pre-wrath people, who are mostly right, they are so close to the truth. What I believe is basically a form of pre rat but in Drasil, but the pre rat people of, of the main views, they're by far the most accurate. 
they, they have so much right. They, they understand that the rapture happens between the sixth and seventh seal, that there's a difference between tribulation and wrath, that one comes from the devil, one comes from God, that it cannot happen until we know who the Antichrist is and the abomination is set up. Almost everything they say is right. Um, almost. They have, I believe they have the identity of the restrainer wrong, but most of what they say is right. Many of them think that the 1290 is just, as I said, a year with two months of Adar, two Februaries, as it were. And it's going to be a time after the seven years when the Lord is going to be remaking the earth when things like that for the millennium. But the text of Daniel says, no, it is between the 1290 and the 1335 when that happens. So how do we reconcile the woman fleeing for 1260 instead of 1290? Now, the 1260 would have to commence right at the second half. Pay attention. I know this is complicated for new believers. Jesus was emphatic in the Olivet Discourse, pointing back to Daniel. When you see the abomination, fasten your seatbelt. That's the... Paul, the Episunagage are gathering to Christ will not happen until the Antichrist is revealed and he takes his place in the temple. Fasten your seatbelt when that happens. At the midpoint, he shows his true colors, turns on Israel, tries to exterminate the believers, and all hell is broken loose, unrestrained. Satan demands equal time. Jesus had three and a half years. Satan will demand three and a half years of ministry. Again, separate but related subject. It's going to go on a rampage against the believers who will be rescued and against Israel. Well, that has to be the midpoint when he shows us colors when the abomination is set up is around as, as at the midpoint. The rapture can't happen until that takes place. Yet, the man child, the rapture happens before the 1260. We cannot know the day or the hour. Be careful of people who set dates. But we are to know what time of the night the thief is coming. Is he coming in the second watch or the third? We are to be ready. The return of Christ is not to take overtake faithful believers by surprise. They will be wise virgins with oil in their lamps dressed and ready to move out. It'll take the world by surprise. It'll take the apostate church by surprise. It'll take Israel by surprise, but it will not take the faithful believers by surprise. You got 1260, 1290, and 1335. I've got no problem with agreeing with those who say the 1335 is the initiation of the millennial kingdom. 
But Daniel says from the time of setting up the abomination when the sacrifices end in the temple, in the, in the tribulational temple, it's 1,290 days. Where's the 30 days? If the man-child is taken up before the 1260, this would seem to indicate that the return of Christ must take place at some point very soon, within a month of the abomination of desolations being set up. The twelve sixty begins when the man, when the rapture, when the baby's taken up. Okay. So where was the other thirty days? On what basis can you put it at the end and say it's the millennium when Daniel says, "No, the, the millennium's thirteen thirty-five." If that was the case, you wouldn't need the twelve ninety. Would just say the thirteen thirty-five. But it says the 1290. From the time the abomination is set up, there'll be 1290. Now, the 1290 will be the white horse of Jesus when he sets up the millennial kingdom and destroys the kingdom of Antichrist finally and totally. The saints come with him and take dominion in fulfillment of Daniel 7. That happens at the 1290 in the millennium. But the rapture is before that. The rapture happens after the abomination is set up at the midpoint, but before the woman flees. It's when the man child is born and caught up to heaven. The rapture, as best I can see, we don't know the day or the hour, but we know the time of the night. He's coming like a thief in the night. Will happen very soon after the abomination is set up. Within that month. The day, the hour, we cannot say. But that is the one month we cannot account for. Yet it's there. I am not in any way date setting or suggesting a day or an hour. I'm simply saying that when you look at Revelation 11 and a Revelation 12, which have a disconnect between them again, because chapter 12 is non sequential, be that as it may. It affirms and amplifies what Jesus said. When you see the abomination set up, get ready. <laughs> it affirms and amplifies what Paul said. Taking a seat in the temple of God, then the Episunagage comes. When that image is set up, the Lord is coming imminently. Imminence does not exist now. Don't believe the people who say it does. The only way imminency exists now is in the sense of what Jesus taught about the wealthy farmer with the two barns. You fool tonight, you foolish man, your soul's required from you. Do you believe Jesus can come at any second? I believe Jesus can come at any second for me or he can come at any second for you. We should live our lives accordingly. He can come at any time for any of us. But he is not coming for the rapture until we know who the Antichrist is and until that abomination is set up. And it will be very shortly after that. Very shortly. Matter of weeks. Don't know. Matter of days. Don't know. 
but I know it's going to be shortly after that. Day of the hour, we can't know. But we can know it'll be in that time. It'll have to be after the image is set up, but before the 1260 of the woman. That's as clear as I can see it at the present time. Now, again, I don't claim to be the man who possesses the oracle. I don't claim to be more enlightened than other people. I don't claim to, to, to have a crystal ball that the Lord gave me for a birthday present and I can look into it. I don't claim any of that. All I'm saying is pray and test it. I don't take these things lightly. Let few of you be teachers. Teachers will be judged more strictly than the rest. That discrepancy between the 1260 and the 1290. Puts the words of Jesus in the Olivet Discourse when you see the abomination set up. And the words of Daniel, the Shikutsa Meshomen, when you see it set up, it puts it in huge, bold print. Once you see that, get ready. Now, of course, there is another way by which the Antichrist's identity will also be confirmed. That is the mark of the beast. But that is, again, a related but separate issue. It's not our subject now. We're looking at the ministry of Elijah and the 1260. <laughs> and so we've looked at it. That's as far as I'm prepared to go at present. This has been a very complicated Bible study, and I apologize to new believers. I hope you are able to follow it. It should be posted on Moriel TV and on RTN. You can watch it and uh, access it if you need to rewatch it. But uh, it will be difficult for me to answer questions because there's so much here I don't know. I told you what I believe I do know. I can't get into discussions about speculations. I've told you what I believe I do know at this point about the 1260, the 1290 of Elijah. I don't want to go beyond that. Now, I will take maybe just a very few questions. They must, must be about tonight's Bible study and nothing else. Jacob, thank you so much. As you say, it was so rich. There's just so much to go through, and we won't be able to analyze every nuance and every line of scripture which you've brought to us tonight. But I just want to deal with a couple of issues, Jacob. I've been watching the trail of comments as you've been delivering the message. In relation to 1260 verses to 1290, we read in Matthew 24, 22, that if those days had not already been cut short, is there any possibility those 30 days is that cut short period? The Colobo, the cutting short, will take place during that 30 days to the best of my understanding, yes. Okay, thank you. The other thing we've been looking at tonight, uh, Jacob, and it's something which is so prevalent today in the world, not just in Christendom, but also in politics and economics and everything, is the whole idea of Jezebel and Ahab. And you mentioned it again tonight. And we look at recent government situations, particularly in the US. You've now got Jill Biden and her husband, O Biden. You've had the, the Reagans, Nancy. And of course, you've had um, Hillary Clinton with her husband. All of those women whispering in their husband's ear. Is there any potential for that future government around the time of the Antichrist to be in a like manner that it may be a man at the helm, but actually. The Antichrist will women? not have a wife to limitate Jesus, who was single, okay? Whether he'll be a homosexual or not, people speculate, but he'll not have a wife. But he will have a bride. The church is the bride of Christ. Mm -hmm. The false religious system of the world, the wicked woman of Revelation, is the bride of Antichrist. But when she outlives her usefulness, he gets rid of it. But he will have a bride. Yeah. Okay. She's... The wicked woman of Revelation is a counterfeit 
of the Bride of Christ. This is, this is the satanic antichrist counterfeit of the Bride of Christ. And she is personified by the wicked woman of the Bible. The Lila being one of them, uh, Queen Athlia being another, but by far the worst is Jezebel. Being Jezebel, yes. No, Again, thank we you. have other teachings explaining this about the Jason, wicked woman. I want to go to Greg. Greg's an, a new viewer tonight. And Greg has been asking some questions as we go along. He's a recent believer as well, but he, he's caught in a bit of a quagmire with some of the things that you've taught. So if I hand over to Greg, Greg just wants to ask specific questions about the two witnesses. He's got the idea that basically the two witnesses are nations rather than individual people. Greg, is that the way you, did you, you're, you're understanding it? How's it going there? How you doing, Jacob? I'm okay. Where are you based, Greg? At Dublin, Ireland. In Dublin, okay. No, I wasn't asking, asking the question. I was talking to the people in the lobby there. It's just what I heard uh, teaching that the spirit of Elijah would be poured out on the church and we would witness for three years and the Antichrist would go war against the saints and we would be persecuted for three years. Hence, the two bodies, the two witnesses lying down for three days and then they'd be raptured. Yeah, there's people who've tried to say things like the two witnesses of the Old and New Testament, the, the Seventh-day Adventists say that. Others say that the two witnesses are corporate groups of people. They will be specific. They will be specific individuals. I'm quite convinced they will be specific individuals. When you look at the totality of what Scripture says, going back to Malachi, it's an individual. Remember, John the Baptist had the spirit of Elijah, and he came before, before the first coming. He was an individual. Now they had followers. The sons of the prophets followed Elijah. Some of the apostles and the disciples of Jesus had been followers of John the Baptist. They will have followers. Elisha, who had the same spirit and double portion, had followers. There will be a group of people with them, but not to the negation of a specific individual. Does that answer your question? Yes. Okay. okay. That's nice to the point. Thanks, Greg. Brent, Brent Kellerman, you have a question. Brent, are you still there? You've got a question for Jacob? Oh, yes. You hear me, Jacob? Hi, good evening. Yes. Where are you, please? I am in uh, up in the Edmonton, Alberta, Canada area. Oh, boys. Born and raised here. No, it's actually quite nice today. It's not too bad. It's warming up, but it was nasty chilly for a week or two. Oh, boy. No, no, it's good now. I think it's about minus 15 or something like that. Oh, gee, that's wonderful. Well, well it is for us, Jacob. Why don't you go out for a swim? Go ahead. Oh, hey, if I want to do that, I can go to West Edmonton Mall. They have a great big covered lake oh, there. Yeah. But not interested. Anyway, my question is, Jacob, thank you very much for this. Um, I've always had uh, issues trying to understand, like, uh, uh, between the sixth and seventh seal, where, where we're going to know the uh, man of perdition by what he does, and 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 the and the, he's going to do an abomination at the temple. So, am I to believe that there's someday soon, the or whenever the the Jewish nation is going to end up building a new temple for this to happen, or are we the temple that he's abominating or trying? Okay, okay. Always had trouble with that. In, in the book, in the book, Shadows of the Beast, I explain this. Seven times the church is called the temple, using various Greek words. Oikos, hegios, naos, heron. Seven times the church is referred to as the temple. Mm. Try to follow what I'm saying. This is the way it's explained in the book, Shadows of the Beast. When Jesus died on the cross... He said, it is finished. He fulfilled the Torah, made atonement, and sinful man no longer had to be separated from holy God. At that point, the temple veil that separated the people from God was torn from ceiling to ground. Mm -hmm. Only the Aaronic high priest who was a type of Christ could enter once a year. It was torn from ceiling to ground. 
okay? A physical, literal event happened in a physical, literal temple. It literally, physically transpired, okay? But when we read Hebrews, the Gospels tell us what happened physically in the temple. Hebrews tells us what it reflected spiritually. Man was no longer separated from God. Okay? Now, a physical event happens in the physical temple, but it means something spiritual. You got that, right? Okay. Now, what's going to happen is this. There will be a tribulational temple, and an image of the beast will be set up in it. However, it will reflect something spiritual. The Antichrist will be worshipped in the harlot church, in the apostate church. He will be worshipped in a defiled temple. Does that make sense? Yes, sir. Physical represents what transpires spiritually. Now, I'd have to point you to the book uh, Shadows of the Beast if you want to look at this in any depth. <laughs> I, got, I got the book, Jacob. Uh, I read it. I'm on my second reading of it. It's a tough read for an old trucker like me, but it, it is. <laughs> I have to go back and look that part up again. But, but it's getting, tough to so, read. Try writing it. <laughs> <laughs> well, I don't think anybody would buy my book, Jacob. <laughs> well, you never know. Yeah, you never know. Thank, Thank you very you. much. I appreciate that. Bless you. Bless you. Meyer writes rubbish, which makes a lot of money. <laughs> <laughs> well, then I should be rich. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Jacob, we have a question from Tan Monique. She's um, got a larger question. I think it's best we actually go to Tan to actually ask the question, but it's more about the teaching and the end time. What's her name? Tan Monique. Prania. Tan, good evening. Prania. Can you hear me? You're in Fiji. Where are you? South Pacific? No. Can you can you hear me? Yeah. Well, where are you from now? Yeah, I hear you. Sheffield. Oh, Sheffield. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> okay. I, I met you once actually when you came to the church at um, Freshville. Freshville. That's the one. Yeah. Um, I really wanted to ask you this. Right. So, why don't the pastors teach on? Daniel, Revelation, and, and let me explain. One of my, even my church sisters um, asked um, a leader, oh, do you think the Antichrist is around? And what do you think about the rapture? And she couldn't get an answer. It was like he was trying to just shy away from it. Of course. Right. It says in Daniel, none of the wicked will understand the apostate church, the, even the Laodicea. They're not going to yeah. understand until it's too late. The foolish virgins won't get the oil in their lap until it's too late. Okay. The time, the time to have batteries in your torch, flashlight if you're American, the time to have batteries in your torch or your flashlight is before the power goes out. Right. Once the power goes out, it's too late to get the batteries. You can have the flashlight, but it's useless without batteries in it. Yeah. You can have the Bible, but without the illumination of the Holy Spirit, it's useless. Yeah. It's just another mm -hmm. book unless the Holy Spirit shows you. They've mm -hmm. got the Bible is an ornament to them. It's okay. a flashlight with no batteries. Wow. What we have to do is make sure we have the batteries before the blackout, because the blackout is coming. Yeah. Okay, oh, yeah. next yeah. question, please. Tom, it's a very good question. It's something which we all need to recognize is that there are two types of pastors. They are the leaders and the protectors, but they're also what the Bible calls the hirelings. Hirelings, yeah. They're in it for the money, in it for the pension. And the first sign of any danger, they're the first ones to leave, followed by the elders, the deacons, mm. and all the hierarchy of the church, leaving the, sh the sheep to the wolves. That's okay. the reality. If you've picked it up yeah. now, walk away, find somewhere else. Actually, there is a third type, the wolves in sheep's clothing. <laughs> yeah, 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 absolutely, absolutely. All right, <laughs> another question, please. We've had a couple of questions around hell and Hades. Lynn and Dave, David, my apologies, have been asking, what's the difference between heaven and hell, and what is the hell that people are going to, and when do they go? 
Okay. Right now. Right now. The final heaven does not exist yet. There's a new heaven. Satan has access to this heaven. He can appear before the throne of God and accuse the saints. We see this in Zechariah. We see it in Job. He's the accuser of the brethren. We see it in Revelation. He's cast down in the battle with Michael, the archangel, and the angels of God. Okay. When he's cast out of the existing heaven, he inhabits the Antichrist. The Antichrist at that point becomes Satan incarnate virtually, de facto. Okay. The present heaven is called paradise. Paradise. But it is not the final heaven. The final heaven is the new Jerusalem that comes down from heaven after the millennial reign of Christ. Okay? For the believer, things go from bad to good, good to better, and better to undescribably better beyond our comprehension. It's going to take Jesus a thousand years to teach us about how good it's going to be. That's how wonderful he is. And no eye hath seen or ear heard hath the Lord prepared for those who love him. Okay. That is the present. Right now, what do you see in Revelation and so forth? That's paradise. That's paradise. That's not the ultimate heaven, which is the New Jerusalem. Okay. Hell is different. Hell is represented by two things in Scripture. One is Gehenna, and the other is, of course, ultimately the lake of fire. Again, Jacob Prash does not hold all the cards. Jacob Prash is not the only one who's enlightened. I would refer our questioner to go online and watch a video by a, a, a brother who was a friend of mine, but he's now with the Lord. He went to be with the Lord some months ago called David Pawson. David Pawson has a really good teaching on hell. I suggest they go listen to David Pawson. I couldn't say it any better than he did. Okay? Nope. Good, good answer, Jacob. And really good questions and important questions. The bottom line is hell was never made for man. No, is the, Satan is the is death of Satan. But he's not taking all those who follow him and worship him behind him. That's, That's the reality. We've got a question from Deborah. Deborah, good evening. You were talking about Moses and Elijah having met Jesus. What was your question in relation to that? That's for Deborah. No, Deborah's gone. No, not there. Fine. Jacob, I think we're more or less. I'm here. I'm sorry. Oh, I hi, Deborah. I'm sorry. It's hi, the live on the internet. How are you doing? <laughs> okay. That's weird. Actually, I want to uh, ask David, uh, J Jacob, if he could take a look at Malachi 4 and 6 and speak to that. I know this couldn't be an exhaustive uh, teaching on Elijah, but I don't think we touched on it when he talks about turning the hearts of the fathers. Yes, we did. Or did we? In the first one. Oh, I wasn't here then. Okay, you did. It's okay. It's mine. It's in the first one. Okay. All right. I'll go back and look at that. Okay, good stuff. Thank you, Deborah. All right. One question, please, from Rachel. Rachel Maxwell. Good evening to you, Rachel. Hi there. Um, I just want to clarify a few things around the dates, if that's all right. Where are you, so Rachel? Got, Where are you based? Where are you, um, you? Northwest of Scotland. You spoke to my son and my husband a few weeks ago. Okay, northwest of Scotland. Okay. You're up by Sky or something like that? Or? Yeah, that's right. Yeah, okay. that's us. Brilliant. Thank you. Um, so you've got the 1260. You're English. You're assassinic. You're not yeah. Scottish. No, I'm not. <laughs> the locals don't like you. My mother-in-law says she forgives me for that. All right. <laughs> so, um, yeah, you've got the first 1260 days or um, right. whatever. Then you've got the midpoint. Right. At which point you're saying the rapture happens. No, 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 no. No. No, no. There's no mid trip. Well, in that there's there's a there are people who believe it happens at the mid, halfway through the seven year. Absolutely not. Definitely not. Then you'd know that you could speculate about the day of the hour. No, okay. not. So you've got this I, I interlude. Never said that. I don't believe that. I teach against that. 
No, 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 that's fine. It's my misunderstanding. That's what I'm trying to clarify. So okay. you've got this midpoint. That's when at the, the midpoint. The, um, at the midpoint, the Antichrist is going to show his true colors. Yes. The abomination will be set up in the temple. He'll be identified to the faithful believers. And he'll mm -hmm. turn against all believers, but he'll then turn against the Jews after that, at that time or shortly after. That is after the 1260. Okay, that's the halfway point. Yeah. So at the, that rapture point, not the rapture cannot happen until after that. Yes, yeah, sorry, that was but my, a my short wrong time. Question. But a short time after that. Yeah, so that's my point. So then you've got potentially another 1290. And are you saying that the first 30 days of that are this missing month, which is the short time in which the rapture might happen? And then you've got the remaining 1260 days. Yes, yes, yes. yes. Right. And then you've got the 1335, which is the start, I think, if you, I understood you properly, of the millennial reign. That's correct. But you've got this 45 days then between the 1290 and the 1335. Yes. What happens then? The general belief of the pre-wrath people, and I agree with them. Again, my own views are a form of pre-wrath. We agree on 90%. But uh, they generally say, and I don't disagree, that is when the Lord remakes the biosphere and reconfigures. In those forty-five days, he, he remakes the biosphere. Yeah. The, the description of the Earth and of Israel and Jerusalem that you see in the second half of Ezekiel, with the, with the he reconfigures the Earth geophysically and meteorologically to the way it was before man fell to the Adamic state. Okay, and does that then follow the 1290? And is it just then 45 days after that? And in that second period, what's happening then? I'm a bit lost on that bit. In that second half, so the remaining, the second 1260. Satan tries to destroy the Jews. Satan tries to destroy the okay. Jews. He's got that time period for that. Okay. That's right. Okay, that's God, fine. I just once the clarify. rapture happens and the resurrection happens, the devil goes after the Jews. Oh, no. Oh, yeah. No. Okay, thank you. <laughs> thank you for the question. Folks, if you're not asking a question, can you mute your microphone because it is cutting across. I think, Jake, we, we need to recognize there is a lot of confusion, a lot of misteaching, a lot of it long established. If we look at our Reformed brethren, they will say, for example, when God so loved the world, that the world they're talking about is that biosphere. It's not yeah, the people, it's not the nations. Well, if he loved it so much, then why is he building a new one? You know, that's the simplicity of it all. It doesn't make sense. We need to look at things as the Lord says. And the reality is it will be rolled up like a scroll and there'll be a new one, a new heaven and a new earth. We have to accept that. Yes. Okay. Final question for this evening goes to Eric. Eric Fernandez. Good evening to you, Eric. I don't know much to answer anything. Good. Good Eric evening. Fernandez, you have the yes, final I'm question here. if you're still there. I'm not yeah. hearing yeah. too clearly. Thank you, Jacob. Thank you, Jacob, for this teaching. Um, really quickly, um, we're not appointed to God's wrath, obviously, but the first the the first part of the 70th week of Daniel, the Antichrist is going to come as like a false lamb, right? He's gonna come in right. with a false peace, but that's not gonna be peaceful for the faithful church oh, we're going to be standing right. on the he'll never like us from the beginning and he won't particularly like the jews from the beginning but they'll make a covenant with death with them okay and then the 1260 12, from the start of the 70th week yeah. to 1260, the 1260 has to do with philipsis the beginning of birth pangs and the tribulation which comes from satan okay, okay. the mega ellipse on the great tribulation the wrath of God, which is the orge in Greek, is mm -hmm. God pouring out his wrath on the kingdom of the Antichrist. We are not yes. appointed until that. But to we'll that. have tribulation in the world. In the world. Okay. Amen. Amen. And last one. Now, the time that we're finding ourselves in as the faithful believers we're seeing a lot of foreshadowing, right? The vaccine, the, the big push media-wise. I don't know if I call it foreshadowing, but it certainly shows the evolution of, of events, how it's setting the stage for these things to happen. Yes, economically and politically and so forth, yes. 
So we're close. We're close. We're, we're close. getting closer so, to the return of Jesus. See, remember, believers thought it was the end before. What makes this time different is Israel's back in the land and the Jews are coming to faith again. That has never happened. Okay. And with, with the with the elections in Israel, with with, uh, with Netanyahu, I think in March, right? There's some elections there. Yeah. Is there a party? I hear that there's a party that's really big on wanting to build the third temple. Yes, and true. the thing is, it's going to be very difficult, if not impossible, to make a coalition government. And you need you need a coalition. No party, no single party can win on Israel. They have a very messed up system. Um. It will be almost impossible. The fact that we'll, for all practical terms and sense, be impossible to make a coalition without them. And that's not to say that the government's going to bulldoze the mosque of Omar or something like that. But it is to say that it is a step in that direction to seeing a temple rebuilt. Yes, they yeah. will have political influence. And we'll up there and then you come around this way. Perfect. Thank, Thank you, Jacob. Jacob. Thank you. All right, I got to go. Remember, Wednesday the 3rd, we'll be back here with a new format and a new technical configuration. We will announce this and we will do mail outs ahead of time advising you. It will likely, it may be a series on the book of Colossians, but that's that will be announced. Please keep us in prayer. We've had nothing but attacks since we began these things, and we have to go back to step one and get it right. For more information about Moriel, check out our website, www.moriel.org.